in July of 1993 at Origins Game Fair, Columbus, Ohio. You would find a Wizards of the Coast booth manned by Peter Atkinson, the CEO of the new company at that time. Atkinson was demoing a new card game uh, known as Monoclash or Magic. He was hoping to secure funds to uh, fully flesh out this game. This ended up being a very fruitful endeavor, and he did secure funds for the game. In August 1993, the game officially released as Magic the Gathering at Gen Con in Milwaukee. The game had a much larger impact than they would have realized. The creator of the game, Richard Garfield, met up with Atkinson at Gen Con, where a shipment of 2.5 million cards had been delayed for a day, but they ended up selling out of the entire 2.5 million stock that they had. Magic the Gathering was an immediate success for Wizards of the Coast, and by October of 1993, they had completely sold out of their supply of 10 million cards overall. They were very reluctant to advertise the game because it seemed like they were unable to keep up the pace with the demand that they did not foresee. Initially, Magic the Gathering had only attracted Dungeons & Dragons players, but in an unforeseen twist, all sorts of other types of people were drawn to this game as well. It became a cultural phenomenon and is known greatly as the grandfather of all card games. In this series, we will go over each year of Magic the Gathering's history, with each of its core sets and expansions, and how they shook up the metagame and the player base as a whole. This is the history of Magic the Gathering. Today we will be covering Magic the Gathering in 1993 year of the game's inception. In 1993, Magic the Gathering released the same base set uh, in varying editions three times and had one expansion set. The very first set of Magic the Gathering was Alpha, which was demoed a little bit at the Origins Game Fair in July. The official release for Alpha was at Gen Con in August of 1993 and introduced the limited edition Alpha set into circulation. This was the first core set of Magic the Gathering and it came with many errors such as Circle of Protection Black and Volcanic Island being completely omitted from this set and will not appear until the next reprinting of this set, which will be called beta, but we will get into that later. Essentially, all three editions of this set, limited edition alpha is basically the alpha version of the core set, and essentially is the same as beta and unlimited versions of this set. These later sets will basically fix any errors that occurred in the Alpha run. That said, there were some absolute standout cards within this core set. First, we will go into some of the cards of note, Alpha, Beta, and Unlimited. Well, there were very many standout cards of each color within this first set of Alpha, Beta, Unlimited. There were three sets of cards that were outliers among outliers. Those cards would be deemed the most sought after cards in all of Magic. Some of these outliers that I have shown here on the screen are cards that would combine together with some of the most powerful parts of Magic to create some of the most interesting and fun strategies 
in Magic the Gathering at the time. Starting off, we have the boons. There were five in total, uh, one for each color, and each of them costed one mana of their respective color. Here we will go into four of those five. Healing South gave you the life that you needed in a pinch. Dark Ritual gave you three black mana, which could be used to cast uh, any number of things. Lightning Bolt, which was an efficient spell that could hit any of your opponent's creatures or even their face for three damage and still sees play to this day. And Giant Growth being the pump spell that many mono green stompy decks would turn to. This cycle was very effective in doing what it needed to do. But as you will see, the blue one is missing from this. That's because we will be going into it later on. The dual lands in this set were incredibly notable. Tundra, Underground Sea, Badlands, Taiga, Savannah, Scrubland, Bayou, Tropical Island, Plateau, and Volcanic Island. These lands provide two colors of mana with the benefit of possessing two basic land types, which is un an uncommon trait in most non-basic lands. These lands come with no downside and were sought after for uh, multiple decks that wanted to run multiple colors. Notably, Volcanic Island was missing from Alpha. In the reprint in beta going forward, in October of 1993, it was included in the set. So if you have a set of Alpha out there, you're not going to find that Volcanic Island amongst those cards. Another very notable card in this set was Soul Ring, a very efficient artifact that would come out and get and net you two additional colorless mana. This was a very powerful card and one of I would say one of the most powerful cards in the set, the vacuum. However, Soul Ring pales in comparison to these following cards that I am about to cover. The Power Nine is a set of nine cards that were included in Alpha, Beta, and Unlimited that are considered to be the most powerful nine cards ever printed in the entirety of Magic the Gathering. And what better to start off with than the poster child of Magic the Gathering itself, Black Lotus. Black Lotus can be played at zero cost and grants three mana when sacrificed and tapped of any single color. This can catapult any player's strategy uh, in a tempo swing that can ultimately lead you to victory. This card is incredibly powerful and back in 1993 Black Lotus was maybe worth about 10 or 15 dollars but today a Black Lotus from Alpha or Beta go for hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on the mission and is a beautiful sought after piece of art today much less a game piece any longer some people do still play the card but it is an infamous card that is deserving of its number one slot five of the nine cards also were the original five moxin mox pearl Mox Sapphire, Mox Jet, Mox Ruby, and Mox Emerald. Each of these can be played at zero cost and could be tapped for a single color. These cards were also essential at ramping up into better tempo plays against your opponent. Just not as much so and not as explosive as Black Lotus, but they stuck around as opposed to sacrificing themselves. These are maybe not as powerful themselves, 
as the Black Lotus, but deserve their place just beneath the Black Lotus. Finally, the last three cards, one of them being a boon, was Ancestral Recall, which allows any player to draw three cards at the extremely low cost of one blue mana at instant speed. Time Walk, also for a very low cost, could allow a player to take an extra turn with no downsides, which was incredibly powerful and completely took over games. Finally, the weakest one on the list, in my opinion, is Time Twister. Time Twister is a more complex card. It forces each player to shuffle their hand, graveyard, and library together, and draw a whole new hand of seven cards. This affects all players, so it disrupts your opponent, but it is also very chaotic as everybody gets the seven cards. It is very powerful and very chaotic, but if you're able to get a very powerful board established, it does not affect your creatures, artifacts, enchantments on the board. So, you can essentially reset the entirety of the game if you are in an advantageous position. These nine cards were deemed extremely powerful for their time, and extremely coveted. Each of these cards sharing a hefty price tag alone. The final card that I want to mention outright is the strange inclusion of Chaos Orb. This card was basically a dexterity test packed into a removal card. While very interesting in design in my opinion, it caused contention in some of the player base who weren't able to perform this action consistently, if not at all. Very few cards have been printed that are anything like this perplexing card, but every game I have ever seen that included a Chaos Orb being flipped was a hyped up moment. Everyone at the table, spectators, and players alike, stood up for this momentous and fun moment. The awaited anticipation on people's faces grew as the card is flipped, all eyes on the mid-air chaos orb, just waiting to cheer or jeer at the player who cast the card. Although this card held contention, it is an absolutely iconic card that deserves respect and deserves a mention here in this video. The meta was practically non-existent at this point in time. Many players just played the cards that they had in packs, oftentimes with decks well over 60 cards and with no card sleeves in sight. Adults played at the kitchen table, while many kids and adolescents played wherever they could, on the sidewalk, or blacktop at recess, at the lunch table, in study hall, in the library, and many more inventive places. This is what the quote-unquote meta looked like for Magic the Gathering in 1993. What I like to call the Kitchen Table Recess Meta. October just saw the release of Limited Edition Beta, so players did not have a lot of time to adapt to the new card game before December of 1993. But players were crazy about this game and more than eager for a new release. In December 1993, Magic the Gathering released its first expansion set, Arabian Nights. Alongside this expansion set was a reprint of Alpha and Beta, Unlimited, a white-bordered version of the first two limited edition sets. While Unlimited added a way for more players to get sought-after cards they may have missed out on, Arabian Nights was a whole new set comprising of 78 new, unique cards that came with a handful of new mechanics. Lands with abilities, gins and their free counterparts, coin flip effects, and metagame effects. Let's start with the Ifrits and the Jins. Both the Ifrits and the Jins serve the same function. A high stat line creature for its mana cost with a downside of some kind. The Ifrits were essentially the lesser versions of the Jinns, usually costing about 3 mana total and having a lower stat line than the Jinns. One Jinn of absolute note is Juzim Jinn, which for the longest time was probably the most popular creature in Magic, as it had a great stat line and very minimal drawback. These cards were used competitively 
and were used for their high stat lines during this period of Magic's history. These cards did a lot of shaking up in Magic the Gathering, as there were not a lot of good creatures in the very first set of Magic. This helped level things out, and although there were some good creatures in Alpha Beta Unlimited, such as Shiv and Dragon and Sarah Angel, these new Afrites and Jinns opened up even more creatures for various different decks to play with. While coin flip cards were a thing in this set, which were meant to add more variety and randomness to the game, they were not often played as they were not usually considered to be good enough to be ran for their downsides for using the coin flip. Some of the lands with abilities in this set that are notable, very well known cards today. Bazaar of Baghdad, back in this time, did not appear to be a very powerful effect back when this card was initially printed, as you were not gaining any card advantage and only losing card advantage. In days like today, this card is amazing in vintage as there are several ways to make use of your graveyard. However, back then, this was not a card that was seen as powerful. However, the next card, Library of Alexandria, has been a staple for a very long time. Many players refer to this card as the 10th card of the Power 9, essentially making it the Power 10, just so they can include this one card. It is a very powerful card in the right hands, and is one of the most iconic cards in the entirety of the set. Before we move on to the most infamous card in the set, we have a very interesting card. City in a Bottle. City in a Bottle was initially a creation to safeguard against any of these strange Arabian Nights mechanics. Richard Garfield wanted to grant the players an out to the entire expansion, just in case there was a portion of the player base that did not like the expansion and the mechanics therein. City in a Bottle was meant to destroy that entire set, and there hasn't been another card like it, so it is a very strange card. But it isn't as strange as the most infamous card in the set, and one of the most annoying cards in my opinion, and Richard Garfield's favorite card from the set, Shaharazad. Shaharazad is a very strange card that creates it feels more like Exhibit created this card instead of Richard Garfield, as it makes a game within a game, and then the winner of that game, it, it, you go back to the original game, it's a headache that absolutely no player enjoyed playing through this slog, but on the outside looking in, it was always a hilarious time to watch these games within games form. I can tell you, it was never worth the frustration of having to play with somebody that ran Sharazad. Sharazad was something that was banned in many local circles and is banned from just about every form of play to this day. Arabian Nights did not do a whole lot to shake up the meta that was 1993, but the Afrites and the Jinns gave a good creature backbone for a lot of the decks during this time frame. This is still, in my opinion, the kitchen table recess meta, just evolved a little bit further, and a precursor to the meta that is to come in 1994. But we will cover that in the next episode. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the History of Magic the Gathering, episode 1993. If you enjoyed today's episode, hit that like button, subscribe, and hit that bell if you want to see more episodes and you would like to see this series come to full fruition. It helps a small channel like mine grow, and it will really let me know whether or not you like these videos or not. 
the help is much appreciated as a small creator and i just want you all to know that i appreciate every subscriber comment like and interaction that you do on my videos it means a lot thank you all again i hope you have a wonderful day and i will see you in the next episode take care